Philippians 4, as we think about this scripture that we're fixing to read to you about Abel, and realizing that there's some things that are vitally important about this man, although he was uh, young at the age by which uh, he was, uh, his life was taken. Hebrews 11, 4 says these words, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. Notice the word plural there. And by it he being dead yet speaketh. Today, even though those that have gone before us, given their lives and uh, that you and I could be free, be able to be here, worship God, live in a nation where we can have liberty. We've got a great deal of debt that we owe to their memory, to their burden, their desire, and all that they did that you and I could still uh, be free today. <coughs> if you were to walk through and look at the stones, it's Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8 you would see what was written on the epitaph of Abel's stone. I believe, first of all, that you'd realize that there would be the fact that he said that the selfishness of sin caused his death. Today, we're seeing so much of that in our society today. The selfishness of sin, taking the lives of others, of children, other people, and then we'd also realize that on that stone would speak to us of the fact that, uh, that it would speak to us of the shortness of his life. You know, you can walk through a cemetery today and see the date that a person's born and the date they passed. There's always that little hyphen between the two. That's their life. That's the period in which they live. Some may have lived longer than others, but that's the life that they live. And then it t speaks to us as to the salvation and the faith by which Abel, which he had, as he served and brought unto the Lord that which would satisfy God. You see, we serve a, a God that is a very proud God. He ought to be. He created everything. He has a right to be proud. He has a right to be in control. He has a right to govern my life and others like me. All of our lives are set before us today as a mirror. We look one day and we're young and we look the next day and there's a wrinkle and there's white hair. And then like in my case, it's leaving out pretty soon, pretty quick. But anyhow, I'm glad that I have that faith today. And Abel speaking to us and telling us that the sinfulness and the selfishness of people today and the shortness of life even at length 70 to 80 years is what's mentioned in the Bible and then to speak to us and to give us the word of God which we have today. Have you ever looked at our flag and realized that that flag represents not only a nation but it represents a God. It represents a God that created and formed and fashioned this nation when he made this world. And his purpose and intent and his desire was to have a nation that would be one nation under God. And then he went on and tells us of liberty and the pursuit of happiness. All of these things that are mentioned to us in our uh, Bill of Rights and a freedom and constitution by which we have. But even the colors of our flag speaks of God when those intended and purposed in the very beginning of this nation and they chose as the flag was made and fashioned in that first flag. You see the white there that's represented as holiness in, the, in our flag. You see the blue that represents royalty. You see that and you can look back in scriptures and see back over in the book of Leviticus and several other books in the Bible how that God in that very first tabernacle that was built in the temple and the very first tabernacle that was built, the colors that were there 
in the entrance to the Holy of Holies. It was that way. Joseph's coat was a color of many colors. God intended for this nation to stay true to that flag and stay true to him. And that's exactly. And then you see the red, which represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's been many, many lives lost on a battlefield to keep this nation free today. There are those in this world that would be as it is in Russia today where they'd like to conquer and overcome all this world and to be the ruler. And beloved, this is moving to a one world government. Open our eyes, God. Let us see as you see. Let us see and understand what you say and what you speak. And then we realize if you were to read over in First Chronicles chapter 11, verses 15 through 19, you would see the remembrance of the sacrifices that have been given and how that those sacrifices are there to those who had, uh, those that had raised us, those that brought us into this world, the sacrifices they made for you and I today your parents, your grandparents, those that came before them and made sacrifices for them as well. So we live in a world today where we don't live just to ourselves. We, the Bible said no man liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. Amen. Our life, every one of us here today, is affecting someone else's life. I mentioned to Brother Bruce this morning as we was talking, and, uh, you know, I can remember back in, I look at these uh, young girls today and think back when I was their age and how the people in the church and different ones, and I still remember them today in my mind just as fresh as it was then, how that they, through the life that they lived, they had an influence on me. They still made an impression on me in such a way. Every one of us is living our lives to, we don't do it intentionally to try to impress someone about it, but that we make an impression on them through the things we say and the things we do and uh, the way we act, the way we do this or do that. We'll be remembered for those things one day. And then we realize that they protected us, they clothed us, they raised us, they educated us, they fed us. Can you imagine uh, that today? Well, if you've had a family, you can't imagine that, can't you? I think back as David was speaking here in the book of First Chronicles, and I think about what he said. He, he was in a battle, and uh, he thought about some things. He thought about the water that was there in Bethlehem and how that he had desired just to have another drink from the well. And three of his generals decided they'd go through and break through the enemy lines, and they'd go get him that water. They thought that much. They loved him that much. They cared that much. That teaches us and tells us we ought to love others and we ought to care for them Amen. as they cared for us as we were being raised. But then it's an amazing thing in this story that's given to us in the Bible that this, after he'd gotten the water and, and they'd brought that water, they'd broke through the enemy lines. This is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he got the water and he couldn't drink it. He poured it out. He could not drink that which was given to him, those that had went through the battle lines to suffer what they had suffered. Christ gave us water to drink. We have that everlasting water. Amen. We have that water where we will never thirst. We'll continue on. And then I'm reminded of Joshua. When you speak about water, they came to the Jordan River, and here they were once again where they began at Kadesh Barbadia, and they were there looking at the scene once again that they'd faced some 40 years earlier. It said 40 years, and if you read the Bible and study it, you'll see it's actually 45. But regardless of the number of years it might have been or might not have been, it was 40 years at least 40 years. Can you imagine the first 40 years of your life? Can you imagine how that was and what happened and what went on and all of the things about you? Oh, you might remember part of it, but you won't remember it all. But here we find this, and 
the Bible said in Joshua 4, and I'm going to try to hurry right along very quickly. This is communion day. Uh, you see, God had given instructions here in Joshua 4, verses 1 through, through 3, and he said it came to pass when all the people were clean. Notice, when all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take ye twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. You see, it was very clear they were going across that Jordan that day. It wasn't a week from now. It wasn't a month from now or a year from now. It was going to be this day. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad therein. Amen. 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 This is God's day. It's Jesus coming forth out of the grave and sitting at the right hand of the Father today. This is not just something we do uh, as, as just being able to say, well, we had uh, communion or we gathered and we had communion. And it's something to do in remembrance of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You see, he knows all things. You see, we might remember a lot of things, but he tells us here Israel had to cross that promise and take God's promise to enter into the promised land. They was going to have to go at the time when the Jordan River was at its highest peak. It was in flood stage. You might look at it and say, well, how can God do that? I've seen people, and I've talked to some people in my life that said, preacher, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. I don't really believe God could save me. I want to tell you, if God could part the Jordan River and cause the waters to, to part and the land to be dry, God can save whosoever cometh unto him. He can save them by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. God's grace is not extended just this far. God's grace is extended as far as the east from the west. Amen. So God instructed here in the scriptures, and, and, and if you drop back in chapter 3 and read verses 13 through 16, you'll see here that there was, there was a time when people was getting themselves ready. And the Bible mentioned the word here, and when they, and they came to pass when all the people were clean. There comes a time when a person has to clean their act up. And the only way to do that is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I mentioned earlier about Abel, and Abel had offered a greater sacrifice. He had brought a lamb to the Lord, and he, he had offered a blood sacrifice to the Lord. That's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so as you see that, and the priests were given the principle of putting their lives on the line. You see, the Bible said you and I are priests in the eyes of the Lord. Every one of us are, have a godly priesthood. We are priests over our life, and by being that way, we can direct others in the same way. I can't save anyone, and neither can you, but we can lead them to the waters that will save them. And the priest stepped out into the flood stage. Can you imagine that? I've been to the Jordan River and seen it. And it falls from an elevation almost one mile from the Jordan up at Caesarea Philippi till it gets to the, uh, all the way to the Dead Sea. But there in the uh, Sea of Galilee, uh, it, it's like a huge ocean, really. But they call it that. But anyhow, won't go into the geographics of it. But... What I'd say this, where they baptized, uh, and where John baptized Jesus, <coughs> you couldn't go there because of landmines that are there. But they've made a place right below Tiberias where you can actually baptize. But they had to build a, a dike across the Jordan River in order for to calm the waters enough to be able. It would sweep your feet away. It moved in such a swift manner. But these priests were willing to step out and to put their foot, their life on the line. We've had a many a man, a many a woman that gave their life for this nation. 
They stepped out. They did what needed to be done at that very moment in order to keep you and I where we can be today. You see, many people have given their lives for freedom. The Bible said that where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. God tells us that we, we are to have freedom. And then the stones reminded uh, those of the great miracle in verses 4 through 8. As you read those, and I won't take time to read them, but please read this chapter. I'd ask you to do that in your prayer time. As you look at this and you realize that the Jordan River had opened before the very people's eyes, what have we seen in our lifetime? I've seen God do things that just marveled me. I've seen God do things that just amazed me. I've seen all of these things in these years that I've been a pastor that just amazed me at what God could do. If people would just humble themselves in God's presence, God said, I'll hear from heaven. I'll heal their land. Our nation needs healing today, beloved. We need healing that can only come from God. We can't do it. Our president can't do it. Our Congress, our Senate, our, our governor, whoever, they can't do it. But they can act as that priest did. They can be the first to step out into the waters of life and to let others see that God can part the waters to make a way for our nation once again to be the nation under God. Amen. It takes somebody that's willing, someone that's able, some that, uh, someone that has that deep down in seated desire by the power of the Holy Spirit to say, look, we've done it our way. Our way hadn't worked. Now we need to do it God's way. We need to do that in our lives as an individual and in all of our lives together collectively. So the floods came. The people seen it. They were totally amazed at what happened. And all of a sudden the priest had a smile on their face because they realized they weren't going to drown. God had made a way where there was no way. The Bible said in the book of James that there's no temptation coming upon you such as is common to man, but with that same temptation, God will make a way of escape. God has made a way of escape from sin. He's made a way of escape of life. We can have eternal life. We can have a life that goes beyond this life that is going to be for eternity. Thank God for the sweet songs that we hear about heaven and what God's done and what he's prepared and what Jesus said, I go and I'll prepare a place in, in John chapter 10. You know, if he goes and prepared a place, and he did, and he's coming back and he said, I'll receive you unto myself as, as I am, so shall you be. Listen, I want to say this today. You see, the Bible said in verse in chapter 3 and verse 16, how that God was going to part the water. God parted the water the same way he made this world. He spoke and it happened. All God has to do is speak one word. Amen. The one word that I enjoy and the one word that I hold on to is that I'm saved by the grace of God. Amen. How do you know that, preacher? God said I was. Amen. God said that I was saved. That's good enough for me. Jesus said, if you believe in me, amen. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place, and if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye shall be also. I'm headed to a city whose builder and maker is God, who has no end, no beginning. God created it. It's there today. It's ours if we desire to go and be saved, be cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they, let me tell you something. There's nothing like that word saved, knowing that you're saved, knowing that you're on your way to a heaven. God's parted the waters of death that we can walk across safely and into the arms of a holy God. Amen. I thank God I've had the privilege to stand beside of many a bed, and I've stood beside their bed as they passed on to another world and heard them say things that I couldn't see, but it was real. The Spirit of God was so real in that moment of time that I knew that the presence of God was there and that life was going to be spent in eternity. Hey, let me tell you, 
I, w I was in the room one night. Charles' grandfather was there. He was 85 years old when he was saved. The first thing he said in his living room to me that night, when can I be baptized? He had Parkinson so bad he couldn't hardly walk, and uh, he was in bad physical condition. Well, he got baptized, and that night in that hospital room, I was sitting in a chair. The door was here, and I said to those that were in the room, Charlotte, her sister, <coughs> Brother Kenneth, and, of course, Papa was there. He was in a coma, and I said, the Lord is in this room. As soon as I said that, he raised up in the bed and held his hands up and laid back down, and he was gone just like that. That's the closest experience that I've ever had with knowing that the Lord's presence was in the room. I was there the night that your grandfather passed away, Brother Otis, and the greatest peace come over that whole room that night as he left that room. <coughs> I've experienced those times. Why? Because God parted the waters that they could go across safely. Amen. I'm glad that when that day comes in my life, God will part the waters of death and reach forward and take my hand and lead me through. Amen. Aren't you? Amen. I'm grateful for that today. Amen. I thank you for that. Hallelujah. <coughs> I'm glad tears are a language. I may not be able to speak, but tears are a language. Amen. <laughs> Thinking about this, and then last of all today, the stone's a reminder. Crossing the Jordan safely. If you read verses 9 through 24 in the fourth chapter, you'll see each one of them passed across safely. But God said, there's something I want you to do. I want you to take 12 stones, one, one man out of each tribe, and I want you to take a stone and I want you to place that in the Jordan River in the place where the priest's foot touched the ground. Now there's a lot to this and I don't have time to get into all of it. But he said, I want you to do that. Then I want you to take one stone, each man out of the 12 tribes, one person, and I want you to take those to where you dwell. May I say this? Whatever you had in your life, whatever, God knew what sin was there. Whenever you crossed into that spiritual birth, you laid that stone down to show that you put your faith in where the priest's foot had been. Jesus crossed over death, hell, and the grave. And when you're saved, you pass over as well. Amen. Amen. And he said, I don't want you just to stop there. I want you to take a stone, and I want you to take that to your dwelling place. So each tribe had one stone out of there. In the, in the breastplate of the high priest, God had given direction to where that every tribe had a stone that represented them. And so as the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would have on the breastplate you and I have been given the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. How's it marked? Saved by the grace of God. Amen. Saved by the grace of God. Nothing greater could you wear today than the name of Jesus. That's why the devil hates it so bad. He hates the blood. He hates redemption. He hates all that there is to do with the salvational experience. That's why they don't want you to speak Jesus' name in a public gathering outside of our churches. It's just a matter of time until they try to silence our voices in the church. Matter of fact, there are preachers today that are getting phone calls threatening their lives because they heard them preach about the blood. They heard them preach about Calvary. They heard them preach about Jesus saving. They hate him so bad that they want to try to bring everyone that speaks the name of Jesus. Jesus said, you'll be hated for my name's sake. Right. We're seeing that today in our society. I know back years ago that we were getting threats because we stood up for the liberty 
of the church along with a lot of other preachers. We went through those times together. God brought us through them. We didn't bring ourselves. God did it. And God will preserve his name. He'll preserve his word. And he'll preserve his spirit until Jesus comes and gathers us home. What a day. I remember that day when I walked out to that old death sea and I died as a sinner and I was raised as a saint. Can't you? I remember that day when I begged God, God, do a work in me that I can't do. Save me, Lord. And God did it. And from that day to this day, I've been saved by the grace of God. Amen. I've not always been what I should have been, and neither has anyone else. For all have sinned and come short. But in Jesus Christ, we have life and everlasting life. Amen. I remember that stone that day, that stone that was rolled out of the way, that stone that let that grave be seen by multitudes of thousands of people that Jesus is risen from the dead. And as a matter of fact, he was seen of over 500. What a witness that is. You see, there has to be that time in our life when we actually don't lean on religion. Religion's just going through the religious calisthenics. And to some, the communion may just be a religious calisthenic you're just going through it because everybody else is going through it but to me this is the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. that he gave on Calvary's cross this won't save you but if you're saved this will bless you Amen how important that stone was and it's an important time in our life as well I hope this message has been a blessing I hope and pray that it will encourage each one we'll go into our communion at this time if the deacons will come forward please